Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back, as is Travis Newton. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and today we are talking about From a Buick 8, the 2002 novel. 2002 was quite a busy year from Stephen King, from the looks of it, Travis. Was it? Let's take a look, because um, this is... Gosh, what, what else came out in 2002? <laughs> I feel like that's kind of a blank spot for me. I think there were a lot of adaptations that came out in 2002, which kind of made it so busy. I know Everything's Eventual also came out in 2002. Yeah. But there was that 2002 Carrie movie, the Dead Zone TV series started in 2002. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking about the books that he had put out that year. And I was thinking, did he put out Wolves of the Calla that year? But that was a couple years later, I think. Wolves of the Calla, yeah, was 2003. So just a year later. But okay, I don't know. I just had like six or seven 2002 episodes. And I was like, wow, that was a lot. But I think only two of them ended up being book releases. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So from a Buick 8, I had not known anything about it. This is my first time reading it. And Same. what I had assumed about it, because it wasn't a terribly popular book and I just hadn't heard about heard about it much, is I just assumed it was another killer car novel. And there is a... Um, there is a short story called My Lady One out of um, one of his more recent anthology books that is kind of like basically the premise that I thought it was. It was just a car that drives around on its own and eats people. And that's what I thought this book was. And <laughs> the surprise of like figuring out what this story actually is was kind of a pleasant surprise for me because it was totally unexpected. And what I liked about it, and this is something that actually King admits in his afterward in the in the paperback, is like, this is about a location and about certain types of characters that King doesn't often write about. So it was kind of an unconventional perspective right off the bat. And if I'm not mistaken, it took place in Pennsylvania because that was where he got the inspiration or at least the beginning idea for this story. And that's not a place you'll typically see his stories set in. Usually, obviously, Maine is a big location for him, but you have a few that take place in Colorado as well. And every once in a while, you'll just get this random location. Like in his short story, Children of the Corn, you're literally in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest for that one. But I think it's always interesting when some of his books fly under the radar like this one, because like you, I didn't know anything going into it. And I was like, oh, this isn't going to be as good as Christine, is it? And it wasn't even like Christine at all. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's definitely not a Christine type book. But, you know, just looking at the uh, really impressive, like first edition hardback cover, it's just like, well, okay, this this seems like a car with a big angry mouth on it. And it's definitely going to drive around and eat people. And the eventual reveal that it was kind of more of a Lovecraft inspired story where it's people documenting strange events um, about communications with another dimension or another alien world. It's like, oh, okay, this is something way different in structure. And I think in tone for King, this may be one of the sort of natural offshoots of him choosing to write about something, a place and a, t a kind of character that he's not all that familiar with. But, you know, Stephen King's books are so often focused on domestic drama. Yeah as like what the the home lives of the characters are like and what's going on with their spouses and what's going on with their kids and you know what sort of family drama is driving the book but the main narrator of this book Sandy uh one of the sort of uh state troopers that that guides the perspective of the book like we don't really get any kind of peek into his home life no. Uh, he doesn't talk about being married. He doesn't talk about what he does when he goes home. The book has a really, really tight focus on the interactions between Sandy Dearborn, uh, his fellow members of Troop D in the Pennsylvania State Police, and their interactions with this Buick. But it's not really a Buick, is it? Yeah, it's something that I think is very interesting in format because, well, first, it was a little hard for me to keep track of things because of how often it was shifting perspective because the way the book is set up is that Ned's father, who was part of Troop D, died and Ned is going around asking a bunch of the other Troop D members about the Buick and just they're telling him these stories, but 
each chapter is told from a different perspective. And I think that was what was confusing me sometimes because it's like, yes, it tells you who's speaking at the top of the chapter. And I'm not always very good at reading the chapter title when I go into a chapter, especially if I'm like reading stuff in a hurry, as I often seem to be with this podcast. But by the end of it, I was getting the hang of it. And I was like, okay, this is definitely unique. And one of the things I've noticed is that King is not afraid to play around with how he tells stories. He has books that have been unconventional. And while I don't think this is too terribly unconventional, it is a choice to have the perspective change so often and expect your readers to be able to keep up with it, which I'm sure most people do a better job of it than I did. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a little confusing because they chose to omit certain things in the audiobook version, which I initially listened to. But what they did in the audiobook version that kind of kept things a little straighter was they chose different narrators for each of the perspectives. And so the main character, Sandy Dearborn, who is narrating what in the book is called now Sandy, is interspersed with tales of what happened in the past regarding the Buick. And all of those chapters are titled Then, and there's no particular perspective given with Then. Mm -hmm. Then is an omniscient narrator. Basically, Then is Stephen King. And then whenever they cut back to Now, they make sure that they provide the name of the speaker um, who's speaking in first person. But everything that's Then is third person omniscient and because it gets into stuff like how certain characters are feeling about certain things like things sandy dearborn possibly you know had no idea of of you know what was going on inside people's heads and you know people's inner thought process and things like that so it has to be some sort of omniscient narrator and that felt really odd to me because the framing of the narrative regarding the buick is all sandy dearborn telling Ned what happened. But then to switch perspective to some other sort of floating omniscient narrator is a little jarring. Yeah, and there are quite a few characters in this, but I think the fact that we're only hearing from a couple more often than the others helps a little bit. But what did you think of this group of characters in general? Because it really felt like Troop D had experienced so many different things that even if you had just had Sandy's perspective the entire time and you didn't look into Shirley's perspective or any of the other Troop D members, it would have still been a very interesting book. But the fact that they get sort of the entire group together again to tell these stories feels really neat. It does feel really neat, but you know, I had difficulty at times telling certain perspectives apart because, again, there's really no peek into the inner lives of these characters except for the rare fleeting moments. You know, there's another trooper named Eddie Jackaboys who, um, there's a story one night where he pulls a guy over and it turns out like it was his grade school bully. And so they get a little bit into like the interactions that these two had in, in high school or middle school or whatever it is. But that's only just a fleeting moment of backstory for that character. Really, if it's not pertaining to the Buick, the book does a really breezy job describing stuff. Um, because we get peeks into everybody's heads, but it's pretty much just surrounding their work life. And it'll do things like if they go to lunch or if they go to dinner after work or something like that, it might stick with them a little bit while they're sitting and you know eating and, and having conversations. But if it revolves around work and revolves around the Buick, then like that's what King is really interested in with this book. Once they go home, mm, <laughs> the story doesn't really care about it. It's a story that definitely revolves around stories more than characters, which is odd for him. You take a look at something like It, and you have a larger group of characters in that book, but because you're splitting time with them between their adult selves and their children selves, you know, you have a good sense of what their home lives are like in the past and present, you really know who those characters are at their core. And with this group of characters, and then Ned as well, Ned has suffered this loss, but you never really feel that from the character because he's just getting these stories out of his dad's friends. 
Yeah, they don't really get into sort of the emotional headspace of the kind of loss and the trauma that happens to these characters until the very end of the book. So at the end of the novel, once Eddie Jacoboys has died, <laughs> they they kind of get into the emotional headspace of what it's like to come across, you know, uh, a friend, you know, particularly in a small town like these people live in, you know, a friend that has died and, and, and in such a, a horrible way as Eddie Jacoboys did. That is, I think, some place that the book has to earn um, it has to work towards getting there because while there is this death and this trauma that sort of incites the story, you know, Ned's dad dying at the hands of a, a drunk driver on the side of the road, it's just something that happens as an exciting incident that is described so that there can be a reason for Ned to get these stories out of these people. And for a lot of it, you know, because so much of it is in first person, you know, people talking about what had happened, it, it almost reads like an epistolary novel you know, where it's like writings from one character to another, but because it's not, it's definitely, it doesn't lack, it doesn't have that epistolary structure. You know, we just don't get those sort of mundane details that would sort of flesh these characters out more. And I never really got a really solid sense of place um, when he talks about the location with Western Pennsylvania. I mean, obviously, you know, King's idea of New England is a very solid idea, especially if, once you've read all of his sort of New England set stuff. It's like, okay, I feel like this is all a, a really solidly described place. And that's probably just because it spans, you know, many, many novels. But to go to Western Pennsylvania, and they're really just talking about like roads they drove on and diners they ate at. I'm just like, this could be anywhere. Um, so it, it's it doesn't have a whole lot of character as a place. But, you know, there are fun characters to to spend time around at the station plus you have the fact that much in the same way christine is a character the buick is definitely a character in this and it does have some similarities because at the end there ned is talking about how the crack in the windshield hasn't healed and it's almost kind of like how christine would put itself back together again and it would just look like a brand new car after being totally smashed in and things like that. So you do have minute similarities in this. And I think it was a good idea for him not to go in that same direction. Yeah. And they talk about how the car is kind of like this regulator between the worlds. And you get the feeling that if they were to try to destroy it, which they did discuss... The car maybe wouldn't let them destroy it because there are so many things happening surrounding this car that they don't understand. You don't really know if you'd ever be able to get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, the biggest difference between this and Christine, obviously, is that Christine is a car. The Buick I don't think it's a car. I mean, they really describe it as a car only in a surface way where you could glance at it and it appears to be a car. But one of the really interesting and creepy things that I love about this book is that once they start to take a look at the car, they find it pulled over at a gas station somewhere and it's been abandoned essentially. And mm -hmm. the cops are looking at it and they're figuring out that nothing in the interior of the car makes any sense. Right. It's basically an imitation of the car. But really, the heart of this story is not about a car at all. It's not about, you know, car fetishism, kind of like Christine was, you know, it was about, you know, working on cars and working on car hardware and being in the garage. And, you know, really, that was a car lover's book. This, however, is about a group of people who discover a portal to another world. And they try to document all the weird happenings that happen around the portal. Um, the fact that it looks like a car is almost coincidental. You know, it was basically just a disguise. And we never really find out, like, well, what alien being created the car or is the car itself an alien being? None of that really matters in the end. All of it is just um, how are these people dealing with this portal, this unstable portal to another world? The funny thing is... My two least favorite King books so far have involved aliens in some capacity, but with this, it felt yeah. <laughs> different because the Tommyknockers is literally like an alien invasion kind of story. With Dreamcatcher, there are like aliens taking over people's minds and things along those lines, but with this, because it was more of a multidimensional thing, it didn't feel like it was quite the same kind of alien story. It's almost in a way kind of like Superman. 
You know, Superman looks human, but is obviously an alien, just like this car looks like a car, but isn't exactly a car. Right. It's sort of uh, almost a a profane or perverse imitation of a car. Like there are parts in the engine that are supposed to be there that aren't. And, you know, parts in the engine that sort of feed into parts that shouldn't be there. It's, it's a perverse recreation of what some sort of consciousness thinks a car should look like, but it's, it's just not a car. Um, and then this whole thing is like, well, okay, the car eats people. Mm, does it really? It doesn't. Um, there are several characters in the novel that the car, transports to some other world at least we assume that's what's happening for the longest time the climax of the novel definitely definitively states like okay yes there are pieces of those people that disappeared from earth in this other world wherever it may be but the book really is just this escalating series of events that describe things disappearing into the car and things coming out of the car and the most interesting, you know, because I, I love monsters, the most most interesting stuff to me is the monsters that come out of the car. Uh, it yeah. starts with this kind of like bat-shaped creature, and they, they decide to take it out and, uh, and do an autopsy on it or, or a necropsy. But um, the kind of biology they describe and the smells they describe coming off this stuff and like how sick it makes them when they smell this stuff, it, it was very, you know... Very gross, uh, very yeah. descriptive in the, in the way King loves to do things. You know, he describes things smelling like cabbage and peppermint and, and all sorts of odd combinations of smells. How things are decaying when they come out of it. Yeah. it. It was one of those things where you definitely feel a little gross reading these things because you know that these creatures that are coming out of this portal just probably don't really belong in this area remotely or with these people. And, you know, to kind of go back to the Superman thing, it's almost like people being sent to the Phantom Zone. <laughs> sure, yeah. You know, there there's just a sense that the things that are coming out of the car are wrong. They are incorrectly built. They are not of our biology. They should not right. exist where they are existing at this moment. Um, and, and King does a really good job of hammering that idea home. But, you know, the, I feel like the cops are doing a fairly good guessing game of actually what's going on. Like the way that they theorize about like, oh, it's a portal to another world. I'm like, they came to that conclusion a little quickly. <laughs> yeah, it almost feels like there had been other supernatural events that had happened to make them come to that conclusion. But we never really get that explanation. And, you know, I joke about the Superman references because it is something that makes sense to me and I see how they could get there because like you said people were disappearing but they weren't exactly disappearing which is exactly what the phantom zone does it just sends them to a different dimension and they're held prisoner there and you imagine that with the choices of who the car decides to take you're kind of like you know what I understand yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the, the car takes a couple of people um who aren't missed terribly no. uh, the first one is ennis rafferty who's one of the troopers and then the second one that it that it eats is like a horrible white supremacist who beats his girlfriend yep yeah uh so long bye you can stay gone thank you yeah <laughs> yeah please um the, then it trades him i forget what it trades him for i think that's the one where the car trades that guy for this horrible like seven foot tall yellow wrinkled alien with a head full of pink tentacles and like three giant talons for legs and like some weird piece of technology that it brings with it that one's one of my that, that's definitely my favorite monster in the book because it reminds me kind of what king was doing in the mist where okay. he's saying that like there has been a, a sort of a dimensional crossover where there are things coming from another world that don't belong here and they're scared, they're violent, they're going to kill us. You know, it was really very, uh, uh, a very well executed scare scene. These creatures also make it feel like there's some sort of Dr. Frankenstein out there and someone is just experimenting with things and creating all of these wild creatures because it's hard to fathom that these creatures would just happen naturally when you read the way King describes them, and it makes you wonder what's going on wherever these creatures are coming from. Yeah, it's definitely fantastically inventive designs, you know, um, 
I don't know if you've seen the film Annihilation, but yes. um, there is an alien in that film Annihilation. And one of the things that the director and the screenwriter Alex Garland was talking about is like how aliens and creatures are sort of represented visually. He wanted to design an alien that would create a sort of experience that people weren't used to, like an experience that didn't translate to, oh, it sort of looks like a dog or, oh, it sort of looks like a person. No, he wanted it to be like something people hadn't seen before. And I, I feel sort of a similar sense here that he wanted to, that King wanted to create aliens that made people feel uncomfortable. Like their forms were vaguely identifiable, but also totally unnatural and just wrong. And that sense, like, you know, looking at the uh, the big talons, um, that are sort of propping up this this yellow wrinkly creature. It's like the talons like are, themselves are growing hair. It's just a really uh, disgusting feeling. And it has this big gray tube that comes out of its chest and it turns out the tube is covered in eyes. It, it, it really does feel wrong. I mean, almost perverse. King does that so well, though. He creates these monsters that you can't help but be interested in. But at the same time, you don't want to know what they actually look like. You look at how Pennywise has been portrayed on screen. You have the Tim Curry version, which is a little more playful. And then you have the more recent version played by Bill Skarsgård, where it's just insane how much they did in that time period. You know, the It miniseries was what, 1990? And then the remakes started Mm -hmm. in 2017 i want to say for the it movies but you know that is a big time period and oddly 27 years so i think they planned that on purpose yeah the 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 monster design of this definitely makes me think of the mist more than anything but even in the mist you know i think the monster designs were a little bit more identifiable where it's like oh it looks like a spider you know it obviously is the best monster because they can tell you exactly what it looks like. And it's things that people recognize. And that's only because they're specifically drawing on certain fears, you know, fears of movie monsters and clowns and, and yeah. certain, um, you know, sort of pop culture icons. Frankenstein's monster, for instance. So this, however, felt like Stephen King inventing a mythology. You know, and I and I kept expecting for the book to sort of make some reference to the Dark Tower. I've never read any of the Dark Tower books, so I don't know anything about that mythology. Right. But I do know it's about sort of like hopping through alternate dimensions and so on. So I kept expecting to to hear some sort of like, oh, this is the creature that was described in this Dark Tower novel. But I never found that. And I'm actually really glad because I feel like King was inventing some new stuff here like you know obviously there's familiar ground being covered but the fact that he's not drawing upon other mythology um other than just like in surface ways is is refreshing and that felt a little bit more like him doing a a more lovecraft focused story but instead of the more academic perspective you know lovecraft loved to fill his stories with academics who were writing about experiments they were doing this is a bunch of cops who have no idea what they're getting into This story definitely felt a lot more like a one-off than a lot of his other works because it has no connection to Maine. It doesn't make any mention of the Dark Tower. And from what I've read of the Dark Tower so far, nothing described in this book sounds like anything described in the Dark Tower world. So it makes me think that he just had this idea and he wanted to write something that didn't necessarily have to connect to this larger universe. And there are a lot of books that connect to the Dark Tower, but they weren't necessarily marketed that way when the books came out, from what I can tell, Mm -hmm. because I had no idea that some of the books I read were going to have Dark Tower connections. And they kind of just pop up here and there. It's not like a huge chunk of the story. But I'm kind of glad that didn't happen with this. Right. They're Easter eggs from the most part. That's what I understand. Yeah. But here, yeah, I I like the fact that this was standalone. It was its own thing, largely unconnected to what King does elsewhere. And it was about characters that King typically doesn't write about. And and it didn't focus on any sort of family melodrama. And, you know, that's not to say that King's family family melodrama is bad. I think at times it's a little overwrought. Like I think in Kuja, they focus on a little too much, but... Um, this is very much to the point The the trouble with it is like they're, they've been trying to adapt this into a movie and there's been some movement on that recently. They have a new director attached to it. And I, I feel like this isn't necessarily a good fit for a movie No, because the action, you know, while it all stays in one place and you can do that on a lower budget because it's like, well, we don't have many sets to build. 
I don't think there's enough sense of like escalating or rising action in this. It's basically just a series of diary entries of like, okay, on this day, the car did this. And then on this day, the car put out something weirder and creepier and bigger. And there is no big action scene, you know, where they're chasing the car along the road. Like, you know, you don't think of killer car movie just like taking place in a garage where the car tries to suck a couple of people in and they end up, you know, uh, thankfully getting out. But it doesn't feel like it's really cut out for a movie because it's a car movie, but it's not a killer car story. It's got monsters in it, like several really prominent and well thought out monsters, but it's not a monster story. Yeah. It just involves all those various elements in its own kind of specific blend. But I don't feel like that fits into a neat enough box to adapt into a movie. And we'll see how it goes. That's probably why this one hasn't been adapted yet because you take a look at Stephen King's books and you're like, okay, I understand why Cujo was adapted, why it was adapted, Pet Cemetery, and two of those three have multiple adaptations. So people aren't afraid to return to Stephen King properties as we know with Children of the Corn, but you have certain stories of his that it's just hard to imagine how they would translate onto the big screen or even the small screen because if you tried to do something like a monster anthology series with this and have one episode focus on each monster you'd really have to go beyond the source material and just turn that into a monster story exactly or you would have to have the car get loose again and and wreak havoc and that just you know for whatever reason the car not going anywhere it, it makes the novel feel i guess a little sleepy like there are no stakes that the car is out causing havoc in the world because that seems to be something that they're trying to prevent. But like, really, what is preventing the car from driving out anywhere? Like, we we don't know, so we don't quite understand the stakes of the story fully. All we know is that the car showed up one day at a gas station. The gas station attendant came out to see something that looked like a man get out. Um, the man looked deformed. They had a brief conversation, the guy had a thick accent, and then the man walked away and disappeared. And the car has been stationary ever since. That's all we know. And now it's, uh, locked in some shed at a police station is spitting out monsters every once in a while or occasionally sucking in monsters. So, um, yeah, difficult concept to adapt into a, a cinematic story because there's, it's, it's certainly not action heavy. And it's so contained that I could see it being a better fit for something low budget, but you'd have to really do a bang up job on your monsters. It's something that doesn't have a lot of action and doesn't have a lot of character work, which is odd for King. And I think that's what makes it so challenging for adapting it, too, because you have stories like The Green Mile and Shawshank, which aren't action heavy by any means. There's not a whole lot going on action wise there, but the characters are so deep and you have a lot of backstory that you can get into with those characters in order to adapt them into movies and obviously make them, in my opinion, some of the top tier adaptations. Sure. I think, you know, if if you want to boil any Stephen King down any Stephen King story down simple enough, you could always say, well, it's a character describing a, a series of bizarre events. You know, if you want to simplify any one of his stories, you could apply that template. But I really do feel like that's what From a Buick 8 is. You have characters basically just describing a series of bizarre events. And it doesn't take them on a journey. Um, there are things like, you know, yes, Eddie Jacoboy's dies by the end. Ned eventually gets convinced that the Buick is somehow responsible for his father's death. And so there is an attempt to try and, you know, destroy it. But that's, you know, that that's something that is pretty quickly subverted when the car tries to, to suck them in. But eventually it's revealed that the car is just decaying and will likely continue to decay. Or at least that's, that's what they speculate will happen is that the car is just eventually going to fall apart. I would kind of be curious to see what someone like Mike Flanagan would do with this as an adaptation. I know he's not lined up for it, but... When I think back on the King books that I've read and thinking about ones that have had very little movement as far as the setting goes, I thought of Gerald's game because there you have a struggle with this character who is literally not going anywhere for 95% of the movie pretty much. And I think he managed to make that interesting enough to where 
he could make the adaptation, but also have people enjoy it. Because when you talk about stuff going straight to streaming, typically with Stephen King, it's been TV shows. You have Castle Rock, you have The Outsider, but there have been a couple Netflix movies. And the one I hear about the most seems to be Gerald's Game. And Mike Flanagan is on a roll lately, to say the least. Sure. And he does a lot of really great character work. But in order for this to work as some sort of screen ad- adaptation, they'd have to expand the inner lives of the characters and basically just invent new material to make them more human and more relatable. It's not that they they don't feel human or they don't feel relatable in the novel. It's just that um, the events that transpire in the novel wouldn't translate <laughs> well uh, into cinema. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I think they could do that I don't know how many people would be into is that some of the events in the book are documented via video camera. And I think this could be the kind of story, since it's basically just about observing really freaky things happen, it could be kind of a paranormal activity type story where we have, you know, characters who are trying to document something strange that is happening and end up getting some really scary footage out of it. Like that's basically what happens, except, you know, they're only using the video camera to document certain things. But, you know, you could easily see, like, in Paranormal Activity, you knew that, like, whenever it would be night, like, whenever they would cut to a nighttime scene and show uh, a nighttime on the screen, it's like, well, okay, we know things are about to go down, uh, and you would immediately sort of tense up. In this, they use a thermometer, and it's like, okay, every time you see the the temperature going down on the thermometer, you know the car is about to do something crazy. Um, So, you know, maybe that kind of approach could work to this material, but all in all... um, I, I enjoyed From a Buick 8. I like that it was under 500 pages. You know, I was listening back to your Christine episode that you did with Katie Schaefer. And then she's, I think she said something like 500 pages is a bit long for a, for an evil car story. Yeah. And luckily this comes in under 500 pages. <laughs> yeah, I think the hardcover copy I have was only 356 or something. So for me, this felt really short in comparison to a lot of things because I just picked up the fifth Dark Tower book, Wolves of the Kala, and that is over 700 pages long. Yikes, best of luck with that. Thank you. I will certainly need it. But I was glad I enjoyed this book more than I expected, given the sort of alien supernatural kind of aspect to it. And King is always throwing in supernatural bits with his novels. They're not necessarily strictly horror novels because a lot of elements of horror also come from the supernatural. You have ghost stories and, you know, haunted houses and all these kinds of paranormal supernatural things. So I feel like it all goes hand in hand. And with this, even though there's not a lot of movement with the story, it keeps your attention long enough. And I know I was getting confused with the change of perspectives and some of the story here and there, but That's my fault because I started the book and then I went like three or four days without reading any of it. And I was like, wait, what happened before I picked this back up? (laughs) Yeah, and they do a little bit of um, sort of odd transitions between certain sections and certain perspectives because sometimes a certain perspective will end mid-sentence. Yeah. And sometimes grammatically the next sentence picks up right where that one should. uh, And then sometimes it doesn't. It kind of abandons that thought midway and, and, and picks up on it, you know, not you know, finishing the sentence exactly, but picking up sort of ex- where we expect it to leave off roughly. And it, it reminded me of what happens near the end of it, where the now and the then stories of it start to intertwine and become one story. Um, but it's not nearly that intricate. Yeah, at first I was like, did he do this on purpose? Is the next chapter supposed to finish this thought? And like you said, sometimes it would from someone else's perspective, but sometimes you kind of had to wait and you were like, that felt a little unresolved. And I mean, I did have a little bit of fun with this at least. So ultimately I ended up giving it a three out of five on Goodreads, if I'm not mistaken. I would give it a three out of five as well. Yeah. If someone is looking for a Stephen King novel to read, that is one, not super long, and two, not tied into his 800 other things, this is one that I would probably recommend checking out if you haven't yet. Obviously, we've spoiled it, but I feel like there's still a lot that we didn't talk about that would be worth reading. Yeah, it's not a typical Stephen King novel. So if you're looking maybe to read a Stephen King novel that, you know, doesn't 
hew closely to to what he does. Like the only thing that's typical about it is his writing style, you know, and his use of kind of folksy, um, folksy language and in certain ways of speaking that are so strange about King, you know, um, that's really the dead giveaway that this is a King novel, but otherwise it's just very unlike him. And I, and I was, I was impressed and refreshed by that. Um, and thank God it's short. Yeah. <laughs> well, Travis, thank you so much for coming on to talk about From a Buick 8. Do you have anything you want to plug real quick before we go here? Yes, uh, I co-host and edit a show called Genre Vision and another show called Fin Flicks. Uh, I do those with my uh, one of my great friends, Drew Deitch. And uh, those are uh, shows that you can find at genrevision.com. Uh, Genre Vision is a weekly show. Finflix is a monthly show where we talk about uh, aquatic horror movies and shark films. And Genre Vision is just a movie review podcast. But uh, it would it would be uh, great if you all would check that out. Definitely go do that. There will be links in the show notes to make that easy for you all to go check those out. And Travis, thank you again. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, that does it for this episode of Chat Cemetery. You can support the podcast on Patreon for a dollar a month. You'll get a thank you on the show for $2 a month. I will send you a Chat Cemetery sticker. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so at Chat Cemetery on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You could also rate and review the show. That's a huge help. And as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Mm-hmm.